Welcome to the talk with the most catchy name in the schedule. It's held by Natalie Silvanovic, and she's a security researcher at BlackBerry. And as the name suggests, this is a sequel to her last year's talk. And I would say give her a huge round of applause for this year's even more Tamagotchis were harmed in the making of this presentation. Natalie Silvanovic. So is this on? So today I'm going to talk about a very important subject, how to hack Tamagotchis. At the last Congress, I talked about my Tamagotchi hacking research, and I've made a lot of progress since then. So today I'm going to give you guys a bit of an update, tell you how I got code execution on the Tamagotchi, how I dumped the Tamagotchi ROM, and how I created a Tamagotchi development environment. <laughs> but before we begin, a bit about me. By day, I'm a security researcher at BlackBerry, and you'll notice my slides have a bit of a disclaimer in them. So just in case you think I get paid to hack Tamagotchis, I rather unfortunately do not. I studied electrical engineering at university, but since then, I've been mostly into software hacking. So this project really represents my first foray into hardware hacking, although I'll admit it started to become a bit of a lengthy project, so maybe I'm a bit of a hardware hacker by now. And also, uh, just in case you didn't guess, I really, really, really like Tamagotchis. So just in case anyone doesn't know, what are Tamagotchis? They're a type of virtual pet toy. The idea is on the screen, you have a picture of your pet, and then you use the buttons to say feed your pet, or play with your pet, or clean up after your pet. And they were really popular in the 90s. But if you had one, say, when you were a kid, you need to know that the functionality has evolved substantially since then. You know, back in the good old days, Tamagotchis just had to sit around and be fed and be played with, and if they didn't like the situation, they could run away. But nowadays, Tamagotchis have to go to school, they have jobs, they make friends, and if they don't do that right, they can forget about getting married or having kids. And how do they do this? Well, the newer versions have an infrared interface. So let's say you have two Tamagotchis. You can kind of hold them together like this, and they'll talk to each other, and you know, they can become friends or even get married. Now, the specific Tamagotchi version I looked at is called the Tamatown Tamago. And it's the Christmas uh, Tamagotchi from 2010. I just recently updated my slides from saying last year because I'm in denial about how long I've spent on this project. <laughs> um, there, this... <laughs> They're the same functionality as the smaller Tamagotchis. Uh, they're meant for younger kids, so they have bigger buttons. And then they have one more great feature, which is called figures. And the idea is you slide the figure on top of the Tamagotchi, and it unlock unlocks extra features like, you know, a shop your Tamagotchi can shop at, or an extra game. So what were my goals with this project? Well, what I wanted to do was dump the Tamagotchi code and answer what I call the deeper questions of Tamagotchi life. You know, things like, does what your Tamagotchi eats affect how happy it is? Or, does it really matter who your Tamagotchi marries? Also, I wanted to make my Tamagotchis rich and happy. I wanted to cheat at Tamagotchi and have the richest and the happiest Tamagotchis alive. <laughs> also, I wanted to make a Tamagotchi development environment, because it's one thing for me to be able to hack Tamagotchis, but I wanted everyone to be able to hack Tamagotchis. And finally, I just wanted to have fun. Because you know all those cool kids hanging out, going to clubs? They just haven't discovered reverse engineering yet. <laughs> so I'm going to start off by talking about my previous work, what I presented at the last Congress, for maybe 10 minutes, and then I'm going to move on to what I've been doing recently. So when I first got the Tamatown Tamago, 
I ran out to the store, you know, bought about five of them, made up some crazy story about how they were gifts for friends, and took one apart. And here's what the board of the Tamatown Tamago looks like. And I'd say there's really only two interesting features on it. One is the EE prom, which is circled in red, and that's the only persistent uh, writable memory on the board of the Tamagotchi. It's what stores the state. So like, let's say you spent a lot of time getting a really cool old Tamagotchi. Um, if you need to change the battery, it will make sure you get that Tamagotchi back. Um, the other thing on the right side is the blob. And since there's no visible microcontroller on the board, it, seemed pretty clear that the microcontroller was under there. I also took apart a figure. And what was kind of interesting is there's two types of figures. There were some with an unpopulated PCB, and then there were some with a blob, which I assumed had mask ROM underneath it. So the first thing I needed to do was to identify the microcontroller. I tried many crazy, dangerous, and ineffective ways of removing the epoxy before Travis Goodspeed was kind enough to decap it with acid. So uh, here's a picture of the die, and I finally, after lots of looking, managed to identify it. And what it is, is it's a general plus LCD controller. I'd say that the two most interesting things about it is that it runs 6502 like a Commodore, and that it has mask ROM. And I guess there's pros and cons to that, but the major con to a uh, mask ROM is that I can never reprogram it. It's manufactured directly into the transistor, so it's pretty much ruled out permanently modifying the Tamagotchi in any way. So at this point, I really wanted to dump this mask ROM, and I had a few ideas of how I could do it. And one of them was to restore a bad state from the EE prom. I was hoping that maybe it had, you know, stack pointers and instruction pointers um, in there, but unfortunately it didn't. This totally didn't work because it contained serialized data. Another idea I had was to look for test functionality because some microcontrollers will have test functions that can dump the code. Another idea was to exploit a vulnerability in the processing of the figure data or the infrared data, because these are basically untrusted data that is processed by the Tamagotchi. So there really is a possibility there could be bugs in there. Another option would be to read the ROM with a microscope. One of the benefits of mask ROM and reverse engineering is that the bits, because they're manufactured into the transistors, are visible. So you could theoretically look at it with a microscope. And another option was pin manipulation. You know, maybe if I was able to listen into the right pin or even the right area on the die, maybe I could see what instructions were being executed. So the first thing I did was I looked at the test functionality. And it turns out that all general plus microcontrollers have a mandatory test program. And I suspected that this would probably allow you to dump code, just because um, the nature of mask ROM is that it's very expensive up front, but very cheap to make copies. So I think it would be a common problem that customers complain that the mask ROM wasn't manufactured correctly. So it would make sense they would have a way to prove that it was correct. So I looked around for this quite hard, but unfortunately, at this point, I could not find the test program. So I had to move on. So the next thing I did was I looked at the figure ROM. And I thought this could be useful in a few ways. As I said, my main goal was to dump the ROM, but I thought there were some other fun things I could do. Maybe I could execute code on the Tamagotchi. Maybe I could make my own Tamagotchi games, because the figures support games. And if nothing else, I was sure it would make me better understand the Tamagotchi behavior. So to figure out what was inside a figure, I scraped off the solder mask of the unpopulated PCB, and I compared it to a bunch of pad layouts, and it turned out that it was an SPI ROM by the same company that made the microcontroller, General Plus. This allowed me to figure out the pinouts on the figure interface, which in turn allowed me to dump a figure. Then I was able to look at the format of the dump, and eventually I figured out uh, how to decode images, and there's a picture of it there. At this point, I could look at all the images, and I already knew a few things about the Tamagotchi from them. One thing that was interesting is that all the text was an image, so there was no ASCII or other text format in there. If the Tamagotchi said dress on the screen, there was a bitmap that had the word dress on it. So that kind of shows the Tamagotchi isn't very advanced in its programming. The other thing I noticed was that every animation was a series of images. So for example, if your Tamagotchi was wearing the dress, there would be every single sprite with every single dress drawn. There was no 
you know, sprite handling or overlays or anything like that. So I looked into the rest of the ROM, hoping that there might be, say, code in there, but there wasn't. Um, and there wasn't, I'd say, even a lot of non-image data, not compared to the size of the image data. So I assumed there was probably logic information in some sort of serialized format. Now, to understand this a bit better, I didn't think that reading the ROM was enough. I thought that I had to be able to write the ROM so I could change things and so see what they do. So eventually, I made a rig that basically uh, simulated the ROM by bit banging. That's a picture of it there. And from this, I was able to uh, do a few things. To start off, I could put different pictures on the front of the Tamagotchi. That was fairly simple. When you put a figure on, it draws a picture of like a wardrobe or a chest that you keep your toys in or something like that. So I was able to swap that out for uh, different images. Also, I was able to play around with some of the logic. One thing that I found interesting was the game logic. I was expecting the game logic to take up a lot of memory because games are complex, but it turned out to be quite small, less than 50 bytes of non-image data read at any point during the figure functionality. Even more interesting was that the game logic, like what decided you know, when you got points and stuff like that, was represented by a single byte code. Which basically what this means is, you know, there's a few types of games, you know, there's the one where you catch falling stuff and there's the one where you match stuff. And those are all actually in the internal ROM of the Tamagotchi. And the figure just, you know, says which one, which bit of logic it is. The other thing that was even more interesting was what happened if I put in an invalid index. This would cause me to jump to other valid screens that had nothing to do with games. So I'd put in like one invalid index and I'd go to the screen where you feed your Tamagotchi and I'd put in another invalid index and it would go to say where your Tamagotchi takes a shower. And what was also interesting was that there was, it wasn't very smart once again. If I say went to the feeding sc screen and hit back, I would go back to the screen that you would normally go to from that screen, not the one I'd come from. So this basically meant to me that the Tamagotchi was one big state machine with no concept of a state stack or a screen stack. So I thought this was quite interesting. And then the final thing, which at the time I had no idea what to make of, was that some invalid codes caused freezing, and I actually had to reset my Tamagotchi. But I didn't have any way to find out more about what was going on than that. So um, here's a quick example of this. Um, in this video, I am jumping to the evolve function. So basically, uh, this is what makes your Tamagotchi grow older. So there we go, my Tamagotchi is now older. So this is where I was at at the last Congress. And right afterwards, I was contacted by a guy called Mr. Blinky. And he wanted to order his own figures and reproduce my research. But something funny happened. When he ordered his figures, they had flash in them. And it turns out there's actually three types of figures. There's the ones with the unpopulated PCBs, and there's the one with the mask ROMs, and there's actually a type that contains Flash. And what was even cooler is that you could basically just program the Flash right through the contacts of the figure. The picture I have in here has a wire connecting the right pin, but that's completely unnecessary. I just didn't want to open up a second one to take a picture. But basically, all you need to do is make a programmer, and you're good to go, and you can reflash the figures, which was great. So uh, this is Mr. Blinky's programmer, and basically the idea is you put in a standard uh, SPI flash programmer in there, and there's also a switch, and then you could go into programming mode or regular mode in the Tamagotchi. A guy called Asterix also made a similar programmer, and this is my programmer. <laughs> but I promise it still works. So at this 
point, I could play a bit more with the functionality. So one thing I played with was items. And the Tamagotchi supports lots of different types of items. For example, you can see on the left and the right at the bottom, there's the clothing store, and then you can buy a dress that your Tamagotchi wears. And then you can also do things like take your Tamagotchi on a trip to see the statue of Abraham Lincoln in Washington, D.C., which is the middle picture. So I played around with this a bit, and I found out it was in a bytecode format. And you could do things like display an image on the screen, play a sound, and you can also change um, stats. So for example, when your Tamagotchi sees Abraham Lincoln, it gets really, really happy. But there was nothing really useful in there. There was some unusual behavior for invalid instructions, but nothing else that I could use to dump the code. But thankfully, I could do some fun things, like make a music video, or make my Tamagotchi do the Harlem Shake. of fun, but once again, I really just wanted to dump the ROM. So I started thinking again about this game logic. And as I said earlier, it was represented by this one byte code that would sometimes jump to a different state and sometimes cause freezing. And I didn't know qu quite what to make of this, but I thought it was possible that this could be exploitable. So I started looking into how 6502 worked, and I found out some very interesting things. For one thing, 6502 is mapped into a single address space. So when you execute code, you can access every single memory address. You'll never, for example, get an exception and you'll never reset. And this is because there's no MMU. So basically what will happen if you um, access unmapped m memory or memory that doesn't exist, um, it will usually return zero. It might return another value, but it will never stop execution. The same thing uh, with invalid instructions. I think what the standard says is it will execute undefined behavior taking an undefined amount of time. But practically speaking, this means that it acts as a no-op. And basically, reset is rare. The only way you can reset a 6502 device is basically jump to the reset vector. Which actually, if you think about this, this is like great for exploitation. Because usually, you know, like let's say you can move your instruction pointer somewhere and you get it wrong you'll have problems because, say, you'll access an invalid memory address, or you'll, get, you'll get an invalid instruction, and then you'll crash. But with 6502, if you're a little bit off the code you're trying to jump to, you still might make it because everything acts like a no-op. And even if you don't, right, it's just going to keep executing in wild loops forever, and maybe you'll get there. So I thought, um, <laughs> I thought knowing this, it was worth, you know, just trying to exploit this. So I kind of just imagined how it might work internally, and I thought, well, you know, maybe game codes are indexes into a jump table, and there's only a small amount of RAM that I can control from a figure, and that's the stuff that's displayed on the screen, but that's about 200 bytes of RAM. And I thought, well, I'll just make an op sled and hope. So this is Marachi in front of my NOP sled. I eventually figured out how to make her move as not to mess with my exploit. And I tried all 250 codes and hoped I would jump to the shell code, and I did not. But I did find some very interesting behavior in a code um, CC. Basically, I found that, you know, the first time I tried it, it buzzed. And what the buzzing was dependent on was if bit three of byte 68 of the LCD RAM was set, um, it would buzz, otherwise it would freeze. So I thought that was kind of odd. The other thing that I thought was odd was that some of the middle indexes um, worked. When I was first playing with this, it was the top and the bottom of the range that would work, and the middle always froze. But once I started trying every single index, some of them worked. So I came up with kind of a new theory, which was that all the indexes were valid, but maybe it was something else that was causing the freezing. Maybe the stack wasn't set right. Maybe memory addresses weren't set right. Maybe registers weren't set right. And then I kind of came up with a theory of why I was hearing the noise, right? Maybe it's checking if sound is enabled, and 
then, but it's accidentally I'm setting, checking the LCD RAM because something's corrupted, and then it's playing a sound, and then maybe it's doing jumps based on corrupted memory, which would cause, um, basically, based on this bit, for it to sometimes play sound repeatedly and sometimes not. But this started to drive me crazy. I thought, if this is how it works, and I have 255 vulnerabilities, and I have this fairly large chunk of RAM full of an op sled, you know, why isn't it working? I could be very unlucky, but, you know, probably not. So I went and I looked at my shell code, and at this point I had used a Sun Plus 6502 for my shell code, because I thought, well, why have a table if it's regular 6502? But I switched my shell code to regular 6502, and I made it something a little bit more foolproof. And at this point, it worked the fourth time I tried in D4. Uh, so this is an example of my exploit. Circled in blue at the bottom is the stub of shell code I hit. It actually turns out that the LCD RAM isn't contiguous, so that's actually a very tiny um, NOP sled, and it was quite fortunate I ended up hitting it. Um, at the top, because I don't have enough room, I'm jumping to the actual shell code circled in yellow, and what this shell code actually does is it writes um, white to the LCD RAM, and that's circled in red. And what I was trying to do here is since I now knew the LCD RAM wasn't contiguous. I was trying to figure out where all the addresses were. But that's just a simple example that shows that it works. So the next thing I wanted to do was to dump the Tamagotchi's ROM. So what I did is I broke out the button lines, which are port A, and then I just wrote out the entire memory space um, using SPI, and then I used my signal analyzer to analyze it. Unfortunately, this wasn't the entire ROM, because the ROM is actually much larger than the memory space, and it uses ROM paging to um, make its memory space larger. So basically, the way it works is the first page of ROM is always mapped, and that's in the upper half of addresses, and then the lower half of addresses can be different parts of the ROM, depending on a register. And looking at the first page, which I managed to dump, I was able to figure out what this register was. It was 3,000, and then I was able to dump all 19 pages of ROM. So looking at them quickly, I could figure out what they all were. Pages 0 to 6 were code, pages 7 to 9 were unused, page 10 contained a pointer table for images, pages 11 to 18 contained images, and I don't know what page 19 contains, but I'm figuring it's audio, because where else would the audio be otherwise? So here's some of the cute highlights of my ROM dump. You can see at the bottom are some close-ups of all the Tamagotchis. Um, some other interesting things is circled in blue is a bunch of text. So once again, the Tamagotchi has no text encoding. They're all images. And also circled in red is some stuff from a startup test program, which was also interesting. It meant that basically you know, everything was in the ROM, which is, which is cool and made me think that I dumped everything. So my next step here was to reverse the ROM, you know, figure out the secrets of Tamagotchi life I'd been wanting to know. Uh, the learning curve was a bit steep. Um, I started off using IDA, and there was no paging support. So eventually, I wrote a simulator based on a tool called Pi65 to try and figure out what it did. And then a guy called Asterix wrote a way better simulator. Um, I would actually recommend, if you like Tamagotchis, download this. It's really cool. Um, you can see, you can step through all the different locations, you can look at the values of the EEPROM, trigger the interrupts, all that stuff. So I thought that was awesome. So basically, here's how a Tamagotchi works. After startup, um, it's in one big loop, so a state machine like I expected, and every time the interrupt gets triggered, it cycles around the loop, and then it waits, and then it cycles, and then it waits. And it's always in one of hex 41 states. And there's a big table that determines the state actions, and some of the states have substates and sub-substates and sub-sub-substates. And it's the state itself that is responsible for handling that. So basically, when you enter a state, it will have, you know, startup behavior. And then after that, it will be responsible for everything except for LCD update and SPI pull. So it will have to play sound, it will have to handle memory, it will have to even put you into the next state you need to be in. And the only things it doesn't do is it will write into a fake LCD buffer, and then there is an LCD update function that actually updates the LCD. And also, you're not responsible for pulling SPI. That's the one thing that's done outside of your states. 
And just a general note, there were tons and tons of pointer tables. I don't know quite why they liked them so much, but there were pointers to pointers to pointers everywhere. So um, I was able to figure out a few secrets. One was, what makes a Tamagotchi a boy or a girl? And I found out that there was an entropy source, um, C4, that is based on how many times a timer one has fired. And basically, this is what determines whether it's a boy or a girl. So when you're starting up your Tamagotchi, the instant at which you press the button to enter your name, that's what seals your Tamagotchi's fate. Um, also, I found out, right, you start off with a baby Tamagotchi that grows into a toddler. And I found out that this is completely random, except sometimes it's evened out. So basically, if you had one toddler last time, you'll, it's more likely than not you'll get a different toddler the next time you raise a Tamagotchi. What I also thought was fun was that some toddlers are higher maintenance than others. Some you hardly need to care for them and they'll become, you know, the best teenager. And some you got to care for a lot and it doesn't even seem to have an effect. So I found what teen a toddler becomes is much more complex though. Basically there's two care factors and they start off at zero and every time you mistreat your Tamagotchi, you know, don't feed it or something, you get dinged on them. And then Based on, you know, how low these factors are, you get different Tamagotchis. But there still is some entropy involved. For example, which factor gets dinged is random. Also, what adult a teen becomes, becomes on, uh, depends on these same factors, but there's also a third factor, which is how well disciplined your Tamagotchi is. And also I found that toddler care matters in what adult your teen becomes. Basically, you know, if you take great care of your toddler, you don't have to take such good care of your teen for it to become a great adult. But if you've neglected your toddler, you've got a lot of catching up to do if you want to get the great adult Tamagotchi. Another fun thing is that you can potty train your Tamagotchi. Every time you see your Tamagotchi doing the potty dance, you can drag it to the toilet and this will increment its discipline and eventually, if you wait long enough, it'll start going itself. Another fun thing I discovered is that the Tamagotchi has a test mode in it, and this was kind of cool. I was looking at the figure processing, and there's really two types of figures, ones with restaurants and ones with shops, but I found there was a third type of figure. So I made a figure of this type, and I put it on my Tamagotchi, and I found it has a debug mode in it. And it'll, it's pretty cool, it allows every stat to be altered, so you can make your Tamagotchi less hungry, you can make it every single character, you can change, you know, what its spouse looks like, you can see the care factors, and I also found a bunch of unused functionality in this. So there were some other secrets this helped me figure out. For, exa for example, I found out it doesn't matter who your Tamagotchi marries. They're just as happy, and the kids turn out just the same. Um, the exception being there's kind of a well-known Tamagotchi trick where if you marry a certain Tamagotchi called an Oldichi, you do get a special toddler. Um, also, I found that figures, there had been some debate about, you know, if you have a figure just on your Tamagotchi but aren't using it, does it change how your Tamagotchi behaves? And I found out the answer to that is no. There's just a special display if you have 100 figures for your Tamagotchi. So I put this online and I got some interesting reactions. Number one, just be aware the user cannot be held responsible if you do these. These are your choice at your own risk. And my personal favorite, interesting, you are putting much effort into something that most consider not worth it. Kudos to you. Ah <laughs> oh, well, what can you do? I did was I analyzed the general plus test program and this was of interest to me because as I mentioned earlier this is on every single general plus LCD controller so I thought it would be useful in dumping say older Tamagotchis and just a generally useful for everything that runs general plus and basically I looked at it and it turns out it pull basically it, you start up with the test pin pulled and then it pulls port A for a code and then it puts output on port B and the most interesting code was code 16, which would actually take code off of port B, fill up RAM with it and jump to it. So that's pretty cool. That basically means that there's now a method you can use to dump code from any general plus LCD controller. The caveat being that port A, port B, and test have to be bonded. So on some chips, you might actually have to remove the epoxy, but this can be, always be used to dump the code, which I thought was pretty cool. 
So the next thing I wanted to do was make some dev tools. And I already had two of them that I'd made in the process of reversing. The first one is called portrait.py, and I used that to put the, screen, the image on the screen of the Tamagotchi, so that's a simple one. I also had item make, which is what I used to make the Tamagotchi music videos. Um, if you like the Harlem Shake, you can check out my YouTube channel. I have a few others. But they both have some serious limitations. Um, you know, they're both for specific things. So I wanted to write a generic tool that you can use to run generic assembly. But the big problem I ran into was that my exploit wasn't very reliable. I would say it's 30 to 40% reliable, but it was very finicky sometimes. It tended to work really well if the Tamagotchi had been running for a long time, but as soon as I started resetting, it stopped working. And I thought about it and I thought, well, really, for a useful dev tool, you need 100% reliability. So I couldn't use this bulb. So I started to look into how it worked. And basically, I was right about it being a jump table. And basically, what um, the figure does is it will fetch the game index, that one value that determines what game you're playing, add hex 27 to it, and then jump to that in the state table. And there's no validity check. So your problem is that you're jumping to a state that's out of range. But then, what does a Tamagotchi actually do with that invalid state? Well, it turns out when the Tamagotchi does a state change, it jumps into the state table. But what it actually does is it pulls a page number out of that table and then jumps into address 4000 there. And then at address 4000 in that page table, it has code that will make you jump into another jump table. So this means that invalid states could do a few things. Um, they could jump to a non-code page, they could jump to an unexpected address, they could bring up an invalid page, lots of options there. And if you look at what this original vulnerability did, is it would return instead of a valid page, a part of the LCD table, which was 3C. And what happens when you make a general plus LCD controller go to an invalid page? Well, I don't really know. I tried playing around with this, writing it out to the LCD, and I got all dark, um, all FFF, but I didn't know what this meant. I think it can mean two of, one of two things. Basically, either when you go to an invalid page, it causes the memory to float, and that would be what's causing my execution, that this floating data somehow caused jumps into my code. The other option would be that executing FF for whatever reason caused a jump into my code. Both of these are very weird, but for whatever reason seem to work. But no wonder this exploit is unreliable, and certainly there's no way to make it more reliable. So I did what I call vulnerability idle. I tried out all the other indexes, and I eliminated ones, you know, voted against them if they started failing. And I found out, you know, which uh, vulnerability was going to star in the Tamagotchi dev kit. And that was CD. And I looked into it, and I figured out how it worked. And basically what's happening here is, it's um, adding 27 to CD and going to F4, and it's returning another piece of the LCD table, which is 4, but this is a valid page. So then it goes and executes the jump um, code in that valid page, but it goes somewhere that's invalid in the jump table, and it's actually a code location. So it's treating um, inc 11e as a pointer, which is actually 1EEE. -E -E. But very fortunately, the way LCD RAM is addressed on the microcontroller, it actually ignores those internal bits that you know, aren't part of the proper address. So 1EEE um, -E 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 will um, resolve to 10EE, -E, which is in the LCD RAM. So, that, so this means that this exploit will jump to the code in the LCD RAM 100% of the time, which is great. So now I was ready to make my dev kit, and I made Tazamgotchi, the 6502 assembler for Tamagotchi. And what it does is it basically outputs a binary ready to be loaded on the figure, so you don't need to mess around with exploits or anything, you just need to compile, load, and then you can execute the code. And basically what it does is it loads the code into RAM and then executes it. Contains a few uh, convenience functions for things like writing to the LCD and IR. And these are largely based on the Tamagotchi ROM. And it's based on a 6502 assembler for Python called Ophis. So making the dev kit was a little bit difficult. One of the main problems was the lack of a data sheet. So I still don't know what all the ports in this general plus LCD controller do. 
So I was able to determine some of the functionality from the test program, but there's still you know, some interrupts. We don't know when they're file fired. Uh, we don't know how power management works, the SPU, the watchdog. And I just want to mention, if anyone does figure this out, contributions are welcome. So to make the dev kit uh, more generally useful, I made a programming board called an eggshell. And this is basically an SPI programmer for the Tamagotchi. So you can take your figure and push it on and then program it over USB. I also put on infrared there. Right now, there are no Tamagotchi remote exploits where you can reprogram it over IR. But I'm not 100% sure that isn't possible. So I put on the components, you know, just in case we ever find one. And it's also a lily pad USB Arduino if you want to use it for something else. So I basically have all my tools there, um, the three uh, programming tools and also the board specs. So today I'm going to do a workshop. Uh, if people want to learn how to use these tools, um, today the room opens at 7.30 and I'll start talking at 8 and I'll be selling kits for 30 euros including that and they include basically the board and the figure and the Tamagotchi and um, everything you need to learn how to program a Tamagotchi. Um, and if you want to sign up or learn more about it, I have a link there. I also wanted to do a quick plug for my boards. I'm selling these at the URL below and I don't profit from these or from the workshop but I ended up doing a very large run of them because I wanted the unit price to be affordable to everyone who wants to hack Tamagotchis. So if you like my project and want to support it, I'd appreciate if you bought a board. There's a URL where you can get more info below. Um, so I'm going to do a quick demo here. This is basically um, what the dev kit does. It's a simple program, but you can see um, to get to the exploit, you have to play the game, and then that's the shell code, and then it jumps into user code. You can see it there, and then the user code, just every time you press the button, says the letter of the button. So basically, that's the dev kit. So basically, this is it. Um, in this project, I managed to dump the Tamagotchi code. I learned about Tamagotchi internals. I learned about the secrets of Tamagotchi life. I made my Tamagotchi do new things. But most importantly, good times were had by all, except for the Tamagotchis. <laughs> Uh, so since we have a little bit of extra time here, um, I wanted to run through, I made some bonus slides about the new Tamagotchi. There was actually a new Tamagotchi that was released on December the 26th, and so I have some speculation on it here. Basically, this is the new Tamagotchi, and here are its features. Tamagotchi! So to distill what that ad said, basically it's the same LCD and form factor as the Tamatown Tamago, but it doesn't have IR or figures anymore. Instead it supports NFC, and you use the NFC bump to um, do all the IR and figure functionality, sending GIFs so you can visit. Um, you can also send uh, text messages using these new Tamagotchis, which is a new feature. Um, and one limiting factor, which I'm already having problems with, is that there's daily limits. So uh, with the figures and with the IR, you could do that as many times a day as you wanted, but now um, you can only do it five times a day. So one of the first things I'm going to try and do is circumvent that limit. <laughs> um, so here's a picture of the 
board. Um, what's interesting is it's a lot sparser than the previous Tamagotchi, but I think it has basically the same functionality. Uh, components are just smaller now. And you can see uh, the EE prom at the lower um, right. And also you can see the NFC antenna on the other side. And th that's not hugely interesting. Um, you can just see there's a tiny PCB on it. And once again, this is the same um, blob. I'm not sure if it's the same microcontroller because this looks a tiny bit smaller than the Tamago, but the functionality is so similar. It even uses the same images that I think it probably is. So it's just some quick speculation. I think it probably uses the same MCU. So that means that we could probably dump the code using the general plus test program, although decapping may be required to bond the wires. And also, um, there's a reduced attack surface for code execution because there aren't the figures anymore. But I'd say there's about a 50-50 chance that there's probably a, that there's a vulnerability in the NFC that can be used to execute code. So it's just a wait and see thing. It may or may not be possible, but hopefully. And then just one last thing, which I think is a lot of fun. This is the chart they provide of how the Tamagotchi works. So you know, if this is for small children, wow, I imagine what it looks like in Ida. Uh, so that's it. Uh, I'd be happy to take any questions that people have. Okay. Yeah. Well, we have. Uh, well, first, thanks for this wonderful talk. We might see you again <laughs> on this stage. <laughs> always, always add some color to these slides, uh, <laughs> which we're seeing usually. Uh, do we have some questions, uh, Signal Angel? No questions from the internet so far. Okay, so then we need something from in here. I see someone at number four, maybe. Yes, hi. Um, I just have a short question. Uh, do ta Tamagotchis su 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 support same-sex marriage? <laughs> <laughs> Officially, but the marriage checks are what hackers like to call client side. So if you make your own device, uh, you can do this. Like okay, it. number Thank three. You. Yeah. Um, sort of the same, but in the last year talk, you said uh, the gender is determined by a three bit code, and you couldn't figure out one of these three bits. Did you get some more knowledge on that? I guess I'd say sort of, sort of not. Like I can definitely see where it has the three bits and where it checks them and kind of what it does with each of them. Now, why they chose to have three instead of one, I still don't know. I think it might have just been a convenience thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, what was that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, is there, is this use uh, at number four? No, I think that's, uh, it for right now. I have maybe one one more thing. That's the thing is, uh, do you have any feedback maybe of the people manufacturing the toys? Do you do, do they know about your work or have have you got any feedback or is it just silence? Yeah, silence. I haven't heard a word from them yet, which I guess is so far so good. <laughs> okay. We have some more at number four, please. Yeah, I have a question. Do you have any knowledge how many hours you did spend on this awesome project? Like with the number of years I've spent on it, I'm in complete denial on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think then, ah, we have some more at number two. Go ahead. But have you figured out how to give the Tamagotchi a soul? <laughs> I don't know. This has actually been a debate on several Tamagotchi forums. Whether, <laughs> whether Tamagotchis have souls and whether I've destroyed the magic of that. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think this is more of a philosophical subject that can't be determined by technical means. Again? Do you know of any other products using these same General Plus chips that uh, your sort of reverse engineering efforts could be applicable to? Not the exact chip, although I've heard that Furbies also use General Plus. 
Also, I was looking into General Plus, and basically a lot of toy manufacturers or toy consulting companies, one of the things they offer to do is, you know, set you up with General Plus. So I think, like, my guess is that a very large number of toys actually use it. Use it. Actually, now that I think of it, there was actually a third one that I found out about, which was a Hannah Montana toy. And they actually managed to dump the code of that um, using an internal test mode of the toy, uh, jumping, it off, <laughs> jumping it off the LCD. But yeah, those are, I guess, the two I've heard of. So now that the that, yeah, okay. So now that this dev tool is out, so we are maybe looking forward to maybe next time see people doing great stuff with this with these toys and maybe have some some uh, yeah some new software for it and maybe some uses maybe next year on the congress. Yeah, I'm excited to see what everyone does with it. <laughs> okay, I think that we have it. So uh, thanks a lot again for having you here <laughs> and yeah, it's your applause.